Good morning. Welcome to worship at National United Methodist Church, Metropolitan Memorial Campus on this steamy May day. It is a, a good DC day where it feels like it's uh, about as wet as a wet sponge and it's going to be 95 before the day is over and God is good <laughs> and we are here to worship. Um, I want to draw your attention to the announcements in your bulletin. We're going to talk more about some of those opportunities later, but everything that you need to know is here. And if you're joining us online, this is also available on the website so you can you can see all of the things that are going on in the life of the church. We're grateful for the great day of service that was led by our United Methodist Women yesterday and all of the things that were accomplished yesterday in mission and ministry. Um, as we come together today, we are aware that we are in the middle of yet another tiny little COVID surge in the Washington, D.C. area. So we are encouraging you to wear masks, especially if you're close to folk. You see, I don't have it on right now, but when the children come up for Time for Young Christians and we're all up close to each other, I'll put my mask back on. And especially when we're singing today, if you can, please, please wear your mask, just because it keeps, we all keep each other a little more safe when we do that. Um, we are, Pastor Doug Robinson Johnson is going to give the message today. We are grateful for the music leadership of Nevin Bender. And also we're, we're grateful that the Willis family is leading us in worship. Luke Willis was the one who lit the candle this morning and Derek Willis will be uh, reading the scriptures. So as we come in to worship this morning, hear these words from Psalm 67. Good words for a time when the world is upset, when there is war, when there are nations uh, in conflict. Hear these words. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you, God, judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you. Let all the peoples praise you. Let us worship God together. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite the young people to come forward. I have all the kids come on up here with me for Time for Young Christians. So I want you to think about your favorite teacher, all right? Get that person in your head, right? Who is your fav? Think about your very favorite teacher, and then think about what is it about that person that makes them your favorite teacher. I had a favorite teacher in fourth grade, and what I liked about her is she told us about parts of the world that I'd never been in. And she told us about France. It was really, really interesting. Who's your favorite teacher? Um, I like teacher. Mm-hmm. One of my is my favorite teacher. Because he's super nice to us. Super nice. Um, So your teacher, that your favorite teachers are ones that are nice and who help you get a lot better. That's so important, right? We don't want teachers that are just going to be nice to us but don't teach us anything, right? Teachers help us get better. What else? My favorite teacher is Taekwondo teacher, Taekwondo. Mr. Bryant from Florida. Uh -huh. Really deep guy, really fun, and he pushed us. It was really, I really enjoyed that. I like that. What he said is his favorite teacher was a Taekwondo teacher who really pushed you, right? That's a deep, a deep guy who really pushed you, you know, teachers who really help us move along and learn something new and challenge us. 
I, I had one teacher in high school who I got really mad at one day because he refused to grade one of my papers. He said, you could do better than that. Go back and do it again. I got really mad at him, but he was right. And it helped me. It helped me. Anybody else think of something that makes your favorite teacher a favorite? Uh, my favorite teacher is the, the French teacher. Uh, and then she's like really nice and she's able to get way better. And she also gives us cookies. Cookies, all right. Nice, helps you get way better and gives you cookies, right? There's all kinds of things that make our favorite teachers favorite, but what I'm hearing over and over again is it's somebody who's nice and it's somebody who challenges us, pushes us, helps us learn. Henry, what about you? My favorite teacher was my first grade teacher um, because, well, she was really nice and if you needed assistance, she'd come up and she was really patient. Oh, patient when you make a mistake. That's important. That's a good, that's a good teacher right there. Yeah. So we're coming to the end of the school year, so make sure that you let your teachers know what you appreciate about them. Because, you know, just like kids are tired by the end of the school year, teachers are getting real tired. But the reason that we're talking about teachers today is because of something in the Bible. You know how um, the Bible tells us, is trying to explain what God is like, and sometimes the Bible says things like, God is like um, a rock. God is solid and dependable. God is like a good shepherd who guides us and protects us. God is like a, a good father. God is like a mother hen. God is like all of these things, right? In today's scripture, Jesus says that God teaches us, that the Holy Spirit teaches us, and that the Holy Spirit comes alongside us and teaches us everything we need to know. And when we forget stuff, the Holy Spirit reminds us. And I was just thinking about my teachers who would like, I'd be sitting, we used to sit in desks in rows. You don't do that anymore, do you? You sit at tables next to each other. We used to sit in desks in rows and the teacher would come right next to me and kind of bend over and say, you need help? How you doing? You can do this. It'd be really encouraging and challenging at the same time. And that's kind of like what God is like in the Holy Spirit. God reminds us of all the things that we need to do. But your teachers, the teachers that we have, teach us Taekwondo and French and reading and math and computers. The Holy Spirit teaches us love. Love. Love is the most important thing to learn. And God, our teacher, helps us learn that. All right? Can we say a prayer? Dear God, thank you for all our teachers. And thank you for your teaching Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up. You can go back to your seats. This morning's scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, beginning with the 23rd verse, in which John is, uh, Jesus is asked by the disciples how he will reveal himself to them, but not to the world. And Jesus answers, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now that I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe me. 
This is the word of God. grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Good morning. I'm grateful that my colleague, Reverend Janet, uh, spoke of Washington, D.C. as a moist sponge. This is a moist sponge day. I woke up this morning on Facebook. There was an image of a squirrel that was on top of one of those blowers, the air conditioner blower outside, and it was just laying out flat with the <laughs> tail flapping up with the breeze. The choir just sang of a holy comforter. Holy comfort. I invite you into prayer, imagining God and the spirit, the spirit that leads us toward love as holy comfort. Would you pray with me? God, if we are sensitive enough in our lives, we feel the breeze, we can in our mind's eye see the squirrel enjoying a surprising breeze. And we sense maybe, God, there are ways also that you breathe your breath onto us. It is safe. It is comforting. And we admit we come this morning uh, confessing that we have not always been sensitive to your teaching, as sensitive to the love as we ought to be. God, we have not always felt your presence. And so we gather in this sanctuary we gather in front of the live stream. We listen carefully, not simply for one man preaching or a beautiful choir singing, but for you, O oh God, whispering a word of comfort. And so tune our hearts, O oh God, so that we might receive and sing these words with you. Come, Holy Spirit, come. 
Amen. Kojo Namdi offered his last Kojo Namdi show in April, April 1st, 2021. In that show, he said, this is not an April Fool. This really is my last show. I'm retiring. And he was interviewed by a journalist for Washingtonian magazine. Great interview in April, the April issue. But he asks him a question at the end, which many of you have heard in your lives. The question is, what will you do now? They asked you when you retired. They asked you when you graduated. By the way, if you recently graduated, could I ask you just to raise your hand for a moment? If you're a recent graduate, I'm going to call you out, sister. Wonderful. Congratulations. What are you going to do now? So they asked Kojo Namdi, and he offered three responses. And they will be familiar to you. You probably said the same thing. What will you do now, Kojo Namdi? Kojo said, I'm going to take a breather. I'm going to catch my breath. I've had this memoir in the back of my head. How many of you have a memoir in the back of your head? I have this memoir in the back of my head. A youngster just raised his hand. Write it. Write it, son. And third, I'm going to travel. Could be your list, yes? I'm going to take a breather. I've got this memoir in the back of my head. I'm going to travel. When we saw these graduates line up here last Sunday here in the Metropolitan Campus, you heard a little bit of their stories of what you're going to do next, and they named what you would imagine the next step for them. Maybe it's school for some. Maybe it's a gap for some others. Maybe it's going to work for some others. What will you do next? Most likely, you've all heard that Pastor Ali DeLeo is going to be moving. June 5th will be her last Sunday here with us. And so you may have asked Pastor Ali, what will you do now? And she will tell you, I'll be at Swarthmore. I'll be the senior pastor there. And you'll offer your blessing. The disciples asked Jesus, what will you do now? And Jesus offered a simple word to them. This is his farewell discourse in the Gospel of John. Jesus said, I'm going to my parents' house. I'm going to my Creator. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, the Gospel of John says. So Jesus says, I'm the Word spoken by God. I am just returning to God. And you know the way to the place that I'm going. It sounds like that would satisfy the disciples. I'm going away. But there is a deeper question than what will you do now? The one that sticks with most of us is this question. What will I do now? Now that this one is moving beyond, beyond my touch, beyond my reach, beyond my voice, what do I do now? Kojo Namdi is a unique man. Who else could fill that seat, could occupy that microphone the way that Kojo did? Can you imagine anyone else sitting in that office, sitting in that microphone, offering that particular perspective? What do we do now with no Kojo Namdi? What do we do when a pastor moves away? I remember one of my favorite stories that I've told in my Chicago church when we moved, similar to what Ali did, across conferences, we chose a different conference from Chicago to New England. And so my son had to stand up in front of my Chicago church and say what he's going to do now. That was our tradition. You hand the microphone to the people who were leaving. What will you do now? And Evan, very young Evan, said, we're going to New England and you're never going to see us again. <laughs> And you, you heard this collective hiss in the congregation. Boo. What do we do when the one we love moves away? When you see these high school students here, and if you remember your own graduation, what did your parents do after you graduated? Oh, sure, they joked with you about transforming the room. You know, hey, we've got a workout room now. But the truth is that they went into that room and embraced that pillow whatever remnant they could find of you. 
Those of us who have launched family members, we have gone back to those sacred spaces and we've tried to hold on to them a little bit longer and we say, what do I do now? It's a deep longing question. What do we do when the people we love move on? And so that's the question that the disciples are asking today. What do we do now? And Jesus offers good news. And I wonder if you heard it. The choir sang, the Holy Comforter will come to you. Jesus promises his disciples, I will not leave you orphaned. God will not leave you orphaned. And we're going to have the chance to sing about that in a moment at the end of this message, God, your love and care surround us. It's a hymn that was written for a loved one who passed away. And at the very end, the last word is, God, we trust your promise to us. Now and always, you are here. This is the good news. The promise that wherever we are, God will be. Comfort will come. In my high school graduation, we graduated from a place called the Blackham Coliseum, which the very night before my high school graduation held a rodeo. Ask me how I know. I mean, you can smell in the place the remnant of rodeo. And so I figured as I was sitting there in my row, cap and gown, smelling what you smell, that the night before, you know how when they let the bull loose, there's a, a, a bull rider and the bull pitches the rider, and then is searching around for another target, and there's always a clown, right? Have you seen the rodeo? There's a clown, and the cl clown runs around the Blackham Coliseum and jumps into this big red container, this big rubber container to kind of hide from the bull. Have you seen that before? Can you picture that? What a job, huh? What are you going to do after your graduation? But I'm sitting in the place in Blackcomb Coliseum about where I imagined that clown was hiding in that little rubber container hiding from the bull, and I thought, what a perfect analogy. This is what it feels like. This is what life feels like sometimes, the bull coming after you, wondering what comes next. When you were graduating, what was your next step? What was your concern about the future? When I graduated from seminary and Mele Tamiopo Aho graduated from Wesley Seminary, and last Sunday at the Wesley campus, the graduates there were standing also in a line, and someone asked Mele what she's going to do next, and she looked at me and she said, I think I'd like to be a pastor in the Baltimore-Washington Conference, <laughs> as if I could pull some kind of a lever. That's at the end of a master's degree, not quite sure what the next step is going to be. Have you been there? Not quite sure what that next step is. Erica and I graduated from seminary together, and I remember us sitting down on a couch and thinking of all the places we might land. We thought of Louisiana, where I came from, Kansas West, where she came from, maybe northern Illinois, where we went to school. Then we started looking at Michigan, one side of Michigan, maybe the other side of Michigan. We thought of Oregon, Idaho, someone here from Oregon today, beautiful place. Why not Oregon, Idaho? We started circling urban centers so that we would know we could get to a hospital if we needed to. Oregon, Idaho was overruled pretty quickly. <laughs> so was Western Michigan. New England, maybe. We circled New England. We circled Baltimore, Washington back at the end of our seminary. We were circling as if we knew, as if we knew where we would land, as if we knew what we needed. We try to organize our lives. We try to plan our steps. But even at the end of a master's degree, we hadn't mastered the where and the what and the how. It reminded me, thinking of the way that we circled on the map these different places we might go. It's the same exercise we ask all graduates to do, where do you want to go next? And so they try to circle a map, they don't know. But it reminded me of a Bible book called Syrac. You don't often hear the intertestamental books of the Bible in many of our Protestant churches, often in the Roman Catholic Church, not so much here. Syrac was written about a hundred, over a hundred years before Jesus was born. And it's an intertestamental apocryphal book. So you've got the Hebrew Testament, 
Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You've got the Newer Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Intertestamental, Syrac. And Syrac offered, it's a wisdom, a bit of wisdom literature, like Job or Ecclesiastes. And so this is how Syrac imagined God and God's wisdom. In Syrac 24, it says, wisdom praised herself. She gloried in her people. First of all, just pause for a moment to recognize that wisdom is personified pronoun she. She came forth from the mouth of the Most High and covered the earth like a sponge, like humidity, like a mist. She dwelt in the high places and in the abyss, and among these she sought a resting place. And so the creator of all assigned a place for her to pitch her tent. Jacob, Jerusalem. And so I made my place with these honored people, and there I took root. Wisdom came forth from the mouth of God, and it's almost as if God circled a part of the map and said, Wisdom, here. Jerusalem, here. Oregon. Yeah, definitely Oregon. Here, DMV. Wherever you're going, here, the wisdom of God, with you, tenting with you. Does that sound familiar to those of you with New Testament ears? There's two things I want you to hear about Syrac. Two things that you can take with you. One is that Syrac is another one of those pieces of wisdom literature where people just like you or me are offering their opinions about the whys and the hows of the universe. And Syrac was a contrast to the book of Job. In Job chapter 24, do you know that character Job, the one whose entire life was wrecked? Job calls out, oh, I wish that I were in the months of old, as in the days when the Lord watched over me, as in the days where God's light shone over my head and through my mouth I spoke light into darkness. And now I simply live in darkness. Job, the experience of being alone, of being absent God's loving presence. From Job's point of view, he's on his own. But for the author of Syrac, we are never alone. What I want you to hear first from Syrac is what you also heard from the mouth of Jesus. Wisdom comes from the mouth of God. Comfort comes from the heart of God. And it finds us wherever we are. Think for a moment about the map of your life, of the people you love. The young people were invited to think of their teachers, and in that quick moment we heard Taekwondo and French. It came to mind immediately. So think of your loved ones, where they're dispersed, Houston, Florida. Where are your loved ones? Where have you sent your loved ones? The first message from Syrac is the same that's spoken in the Gospel of John. There, God will be with you. There, wherever you're going, God with us. So the first thing is to recognize that God's wisdom, God's love, finds us wherever we go. Jesus says, I will not leave you orphaned. Do not be afraid. The first thing, thing to recognize is that God's love goes with us. But how do we know this? How do we confirm this? How can you trust this? This is an ancient story, two ancient stories. How can we come to trust that God's spirit is present with us to comfort us? You have to tell the story. Um, Katie, how old is the young man who raised his hand who said he had a memoir waiting? Twelve. The twelve-year-old has the memoir ready for us. He's working on it. Here's what I want you to hear about Syrac. Syrac was written by Ben Syrah, 
But we would never know anything about Syrac were it not for his grandson, who found it in his house and translated it into Koine Greek. Those of you who have grandchildren who've come over to your house, you know how they explore the house, right? How they get into everything. They find all the love notes. They'll find the love notes, Judy. Imagine how they go through the house after we have passed on, the curiosity, the interest, as they start to dig through all the memories, all of the history. And so this grandson goes into his wise grandfather's house and finds this word about wisdom, Syrac. Had it not been for the grandson, we would not have this word of wisdom because he translated it. He wrote the memoir. I asked you if you have a memoir in the back of your head. What if that memoir was not just all of the work that you did or the classes that you accomplished, the successful graduations, but what if it was those places in your life where you sensed comfort? where you sensed God meeting you along the way. It may be a story of church life. It may be the time that someone showed up at your house with a pecan pie. The time when a person was there right on time when they wrote on your Facebook post right when you needed to hear it. What about a memoir of the times where we sensed God's comfort? Because this really is the only way that modern people know that God does still circle a city and does still send the comforter. The only way we know this, it's theory in the Bible, it's reality through your experience. So I would say to Kojo Namdi, don't wait. Don't wait to write the memoir. It's funny because Kojo in this whole interview, Kojo uh, after he said that he was stepping back, he said, I'll come back and I'll join the show every once in a while just to harass whoever's leading it. I'm going away, but you will still hear my voice. So friends, when we sing this hymn by Carolyn Winfrey Gillette, she is trying to remind her family members who have just lost a loved one, like a graduate, like a beloved pastor, like a lifetime work in retirement, losing a loved one to death. She has written this song about the promise of Jesus, the promise of presence. And so in a moment when we invite you, encourage you to stand and to sing together masked, I want you to hold on to this promise that's a part of the last verse here. Then your home will be among us. We will always dwell with you. This is not something that happens just after we die, but it happens in this life. God, we trust your promise to us now and always. You are here. Thanks be to God. I want to invite you as you are able to stand at this time. The insert is here. That's where the verses of God, your love and care surround us. We sing together.
Will you join with me in prayer? Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the people in our lives who have been a guide to us, whether in the classroom, in our workplaces, in this church. We thank you for sending them and for sending your son to be examples to us in our lives. Yet as grateful as we are, we confess our fears too of facing the things we know we need to do or have to do often alone. Lord, we have known isolation, not just during the past two years, but in other ways routine and profound. But you remind us that we are not alone, that the Holy Spirit goes with us, accompanies us, that we are indeed surrounded by that great cloud of witnesses. Each day is a step into the unknown or another chance at a problem that we've been avoiding. Each day we are reminded how broken this world can be and of the limits of our own powers. We pray for those facing illness and for those watching their loved ones confront their own infirmities. We pray that we know what to say and to do to comfort them, hoping that you will provide the words. Most of all, we pray for healing and your grace. We pray for peace everywhere, peace where a family in Buffalo can buy its food without fearing their lives will be stolen by an individual who is our brother too, that has turned racist hate into violent action. We pray that your reconciling peace finds a way to bring people together. For it is in moments of isolation and fear that we turn away from you and toward our worst impulses. We pray for peace in Ukraine where isolation is a way of life now for so many and for every corner of this world where war and famine and unrest exists. We pray for wisdom and courage in the face of uncertainty. We ask you, mighty God, to provide us with inspiration and you urge us not to be afraid. Let us embrace that boldness and act upon it. Let us be your hands and feet and minds and voices. Remind us, in the words of the Persian poet Hafiz, that we have all come to the right place. We all sit in God's classroom. And now the only thing left for us to do is to stop throwing spitballs for a while. Divine teacher, hear us now as we say the words that your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Mike three, thank you. Our closing hymn rests at that intersection of the peace of Christ and teaching, because this is the hymn that we use when we close nursery school chapel every week. And there are hand motions, so I'm here to teach you the hand motions. We're gonna go in peace, so we start by going, and this idea of rippling, the rippling out of God's peace, right? And then the love of God, surrounding you in a hug, and then we're going out everywhere, 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 and then we're going, right? A little person is going, okay? So we're gonna sing it through once together, and then it's a round. So we're gonna, Nevin's gonna take this side, you all will start the round, and then we'll, we'll be on this side to end the round. We'll sing the round, sing it through twice in a round. We can do this. I have faith. Singer people, can you come? Come on.
In just a moment, we're going to send you out with organ song. And when you heard uh, Derek pray about the surprises in life, the organ was its own little surprise this morning. Sometimes organs develop ciphers. A cipher is this wheezing sound that one pipe makes. There are hundreds of pipes here, but one pipe said, me, and it just stays on all the time. <laughs> so we wondered how to overcome that this morning, and the way to overcome it is to first alert you all that you're going to hear that wheezing sound, and then the fullness of the organ will come in and join with that one lone pipe, and it sounds like that'll preach. Amen. So we send you out with some reminders of ways that we can be involved in the lives of others. When we name Ukraine, there are, there's a tangible way we can respond today with compassion, and that's by buying cookies. Yesterday at the service day, there were folks who were preparing these fantastic cookies. If you've been to Bread First, to the bakery here in town, one who worked at Bread First help to make these cookies. They're good cookies for a good cause. You'll see them right outside the door there. I believe there are probably some in the hallway this direction too. So please buy up all of the cookies. There'll be the opportunity for folks to buy these at Wesley too. If you're watching online, you can make a contribution and eat some cookies at home. We gathered bicycles yesterday. I was grateful Reverend Janet spoke about this. Bikes for the World, where we brought in almost 300 bicycles. Amen. Um, and these are brand new bicycles. Some were less brand new. Thank you for yours. <laughs> they, they ran the gamut, and all of them are going to be repurposed and sent to Madagascar. And I had the opportunity to talk to people along the way. I asked the stories of these bicycles, and I learned kind of how this bicycle had been a part of a family for 40 years in some cases. People are eager to tell the story. People are eager to tell the story of their lives and their joy, but they're not often asked. And so the invitation is to ask the question, especially ask the question cross-culturally. We often talk to our own friends about our history, but this is a moment in history where we can ask the question of people who are different from us. Tell me the story of your first bike. Tell me your story. This is the invitation to write your story, to add that memoir, because there are folks who feel like Job did, which is that there's only darkness out there, and I no longer have that light to shine in the darkness. But you do, friends. So we send you out today with this light, a reminder that there is a concert today at 3 o'clock right here, violin and piano. It will be beautiful, but if you can't come back at 3 o'clock, it's going to be live streamed. You can find that on our website, Arts Council. We also are making big plans for Pride Sunday, which is the weekend of the 11th and the 12th. We want a Pride Choir to sing on the 12th, but we're going to be marching in the Pride Parade. Amen. If you're in town, you can absolutely march with us, but if you don't feel like you can march, there are other ways we're going to prepare this space and Wesley Campus for Pride Sunday. Also, you'll start to see signs around the church for the Poor People's Campaign. We'll tell you a lot more about the Poor People's Campaign, but June 18th, coming to Washington, D.C., we are going to be a source of hospitality for folks who are driving in and need to transition with water, rest, and so there's work for us to do on both of those weekends in June. So I invite you to start thinking of that now. And remember what we said about this breath of God that comes in surprising ways. Listen for the cipher. And if there are those who would be willing to extinguish the candles with me, I invite you to come forward at this time. Thank you, Nevin.
Thank <laughs> you.